you will in less to you. So we have to understand each other's language in the very first place. Uh, thanks to the British, they, they gave us this common language so that we can talk to each other very easily, right? Now, uh, this quantum mechanics and general theory of relativity are actually incompatible. What happens? Quantum mechanics or quantum theory is applicable within the microcosmos, subatomic dimensions, subnuclear dimensions, okay? Whereas, uh, general theory of relativity describes universe at large distances, solar system, and universe and galaxies and whatnot. So, and this special theory, it, it, uh, it's more meaningful when the velocities are of the order of the velocities of light. Now, let's go to the general theory of relativity. So, this is, this is, a, this is a real photograph. This is not a computer simulation. This is a real photograph. This is a part, a section of our universe, as seen by the, by the Hubble, the ultra deep big image. Our telescope, all of you must have heard of. So this is a real photograph of a section of our universe. And look at these little, little dots. These little, little dots are remote galaxies. Each one of them contains millions and billions of stars. So these, these points, they contain millions and billions of stars, actually. They are galaxies, remote galaxies, which are being depicted here just as dots. This is our, our home, our Milky Way galaxy, where we live. Our solar system lives somewhere within these, within these wings of this, uh, of this galaxy, uh, uh, our own galaxy, our own home, the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so we are the underlings, and instead of saying that I come from India, you come from Botswana, we come from Earth. Mother Earth is common to all of us. Yes, and <clears throat> then within, within our Milky Way, there is our solar system, that's also common to us. So, uh, Mr. Sun is there, then the nearest is Mercury, then somewhere Venus, then third one is Earth, on which we live. So that's also our home, and then you have Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and all these things. Uh, why are they important? I would see, you will see everything is extremely well connected. This is Mr. Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who worked at Chicago. You see, now uh, I have so many students here, and I'm feeling so happy and excited. Mr. Chandrasekhar used to go derive one hour or more than one hour just to teach two students. And both of these guys, Young and Lee, they made it to a Nobel Prize immediately after their, their uh, doctorate at a very young age of when they were in 20s. Uh, how, however, Chandrasekhar himself made it uh, maybe 50 years later. So, so never mind, he produced these bright, bright guys. And why is Mr. Chandrasekhar important? Because we are now going gradually towards the towards the uh, sun and the stars. And when you talk about the life cycle of the stars, uh, for which you see the, how the, the end products would be things like neutron stars, black holes, white dwarf, red dwarf, and so on. Uh, that is what we are going to talk. So we would, we would certainly like to know the origin of, or origin of all these things. So it is the, the stellar, stellar nebula where the stars are born. Now these stars could be, could be, could have arbitrarily, arbitrary mass, uh, more mass or still more heavier, more heavier. And then accordingly, this is like average star like our sun, but eventually nothing is eternal in this world, everything has to die. So this will also die, blow up into a red giant and maybe even eventually into a planetary nebula where planet, planets and so on are born, eventually it could end up at high drop, neutron star, boson star, or something like that. If it's still heavier, so Mr. Chandrasekhar gave the limit, it's called Chandrasekhar limit, any, any sun heavier than 1.4 times the solar mass cannot be stable, it will split, decay into other things. That is the Chandrasekhar limit which he gave 50 years ago. So, and, and there is no exception so far. So this eventually a red giant, super red giant, many things you can happen, make can happen, and eventually it can explode as supernova and which would lead to many more of these things. So uh, this is the maybe the low mass star would have this kind of a cycle, mid-size star, red giant, planet image, and this massive star would have red giant and so on, leading to supernova. Eventually these these things the, at the end of the day. They, are, they end up as high drops, high drops, blue drops, neutron stars, boson stars, black holes, etc., etc. Uh, and the end product 
at the end of the, the life cycle of the star. Now, uh, I would like to explain, uh, gradually come to, and, as I said, that this is one of the end product, it's, uh, it's the, the black holes. So, uh, and we are, we are celebrating 100 years of the mathematical discovery of black holes, so I would like to explain to you what is this black hole like. At the first year level, we are taught that the escape velocity can be calculated as the square root of 2 gm by r. For, uh, we do it in the context of earth, right? And if you put the mass of the earth, radius of the earth, we calculate this escape velocity, this is 11.2 kilometers per second. Now, if you increase this velocity, so if you, how do you do it? I keep m fixed and I reduce r to r by 2, r by 3, r by 4, r by 10, r by 100. So, when I, when I reduce this, this would increase. There would be a limit when this r is equal to rs is 2 gm by c square. Here c square is, uh, so c square you put here and r you put there. Then, at r equal to rs, there would be a limit when mass m is kept fixed, m is not changing. Then this escape velocity would become identically equal to the velocity of light. And Mr. Einstein tells us that is the maximum attainable velocity in nature. You can't go beyond that. So uh, that means even if I throw a photon from Earth, it will fall down on Earth. That. Uh, because uh, escape velocity has become equal to the velocity of light. So th therefore you say this is first year level understanding of black holes. Okay, I will gradually go to to little more uh, involved idea. So uh, this is how you calculate the escape velocity for sun uh, for the the radius. This soft cell radius. This R S is called as the soft cell radius. This soft cell is the same fellow whom I I, I showed you the photograph of Mr. Carl uh, soft cell in my second slide. So it is known for this, and then if an object uh, uh, becomes of this size then nothing can escape from it, not even the light, not even the photon can go away. So then that means the object has become a black hole, okay? Is that, I, I hope it's clear to all the, my younger students? Yes? Good. So uh, this is back to Mr. Carl Swatsi, and it is just pictorial uh, view of a black hole sucking a star from a long distance. And uh, so Mr. Carl Swatsi is being shown there, and the, the radius, this radius uh, Rs is this uh, distance, when this is just equal to 2 gm by c square, then this kind of a surface, which is an imaginary surface called event horizon, so nothing can really escape. So this is a one directional, unidirectional membrane. Things cannot come out of it, things can only go in. So once something goes somewhere near the event horizon, it's being captured by the black hole. So black hole can keep growing, growing, growing bigger and bigger, and so this is the one more on soft cell radius. And actually, when an object, uh, the size of, of an object, is close to its soft cell radius, then actually the conventional physics, not even general theory of relativity, works uh, beyond that the soft cell radius inside the black hole. Then we need to invent a new theory, which is called the quantum theory of gravity or QG or so or quantum gravity, I will tell you in details. At that time, so using these three fundamental constants, H, C and G, Planck constant, velocity of light and the Newton's gravitational constant, you can construct three more fundamental constants, Planck mass, Planck length and Planck in time, which is 10 to the minus 44 seconds. This Planck in length is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So you will see that the gravity, when the, when the things reach of the order of 10 to the one minus 33 centimeters, then uh, the gravity becomes uh, very, very crucial, okay? And that is the kind of mass 10 to the power 19 GeV. So once again, back to, the, back to this famous diagram of the showing the Big Bang. So we were going from this way to this direction. Now supposing I, I run the universe backwards in time, okay? So uh, we, we teach something called as time reversal symmetry in quantum mechanics and a discrete symmetry here. So reversal of motion, as we have called it, if you if you, you are seeing a movie on your laptop, now you reverse it. So it's a backward running movie. Okay, if you do that, then you hit upon a singularity which is called as the Big Bang. 
Now, even inside the black holes, there are singularities, as I showed at the center of this. Actually, what happened? Uh, my friend uh, Maxwell Masan is but interested. So, here is a gravitational potential curve. Okay, they are not actually up to scale uh, because this black hole is uh, can be millions or billion times heavier than this star. So, this length actually I cannot draw on that on that scale. So, but this is just symbolic that if this is a star, large star, and the curvature becomes like that, space time singularity and look at this black hole which is uh, several million times heavier than this guy. So this actually has to go uh, a million times from here to here this length, I have to make it million times deeper. Okay, so that is the, and actually what happens, this is the, this is the event horizon of the black hole. So your general theory of relativity explains things all the way up to this, but not beyond this. Here you will see that the, the black hole uh, we cannot see the flow of time inside the black hole, you will see, and therefore from here to here, uh, you need a real uh, new theory, which is called as the quantum theory of gravity. You have to somehow marry general theory of relativity with quantum mechanics. We were able to do it for special theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, but one has to be able to do it for general theory of relativity with quantum mechanics. Of course, uh, people can do it, and that's... Uh, a candidate theory for that, that is called as the string theory, which eventually could be, but, but I, I don't rule out the possibility that one could invent some new alternative theories to that, but you need a quantum theory of gravity, which could explain things of this, this inside this. So actually, it should be able to explain, I introduced these three new constants, Planckian mass, Planckian length, and Planckian time. So, when the universe was born, then up to from time t equal to 0 to time t equal to 10, uh, 10 to the power minus 44 seconds. In this domain, no presently available theory can explain what happens during this time. Our theories that we know can explain beyond 10 to the power minus 44 seconds up to the present day, but, but not from 0 to 10 to the power minus 44 up to Planck and time. So, uh, this is the domain where you need that quantum theory of gravity. Also, black holes are not also not eternal, they eventually die out, they decay. And the information that once made this black hole uh, maybe gets destroyed when the black hole is dead, everything is evaporated out. So, uh, but then this would clash with the unitarity of quantum mechanics. You see, you talk about there is my. Uh, 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 my quantum mechanics friend, where is he? Please. Yes, there he is. Yes. There he sits. So, he would immediately agree uh, that the you have to talk about unitary operators in quantum mechanics. Correct? Uh, unitarity is a very sacred concept. You can't violate it. Okay? So, unitarity of quantum mechanics has to be respected and Mr. Stephen Hawking says, however difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do about it and maybe help yourself. So, <coughs> then it's a, a, a small brief recap of these fundamental forces of nature. Uh, if you divide the strength of all the four forces by the strength of the strong nuclear force, so that it becomes 1, then this is 10 to the minus 3, this is 10 to the minus 13, this is 10 to the minus 39. So, gravity, gravitational force, although it is very so obvious, you some put something here, or you drop something, it goes to the ground. It's so obvious, but it is so difficult to handle it because it's very, very weak as compared to these forces. And uh, so without this gravitational interaction, the other three interactions can be very well explained in the language of the so-called uh, standard model of physics, which is conventional particle physics, which consists there, you have 12 fundamental matter particles, six quarks and six leptons, and uh, uh, the mediators of these forces, the vector gauge bosons. Uh, uh, mind you, please, each and every of these objects has got more than one Nobel Prize for theoretical, for in experimental investigation, for and in between many, many complicated theories, uh, for which, I mean, right from the advent of the quark, quark models, and so on, many, many Nobel Prizes have gone to this. And so here is a Victorian representation of our current, current understanding of the fundamental constituents of nature, the six quarks up and down, charm and string, beauty and top. 
and electron, muon, tau on, electronic, muonic, and tauonic neutron. These are the 12 fundamental constituents of matter. So these are six quarks, these are six leptons. This is called first generation, second generation, and third generation. And these four uh, are the, the, the force carrier. Photon is only one kind of photon. Gluons are eight kinds of gluons. Uh, you use them. So when quarks talk to each other, when neutrons, protons talk to each other, via the exchange of a strong nuclear force, you have eight of these force carriers, which are eight gluons. And these are W plus minus G for theoretical, for experimental investigation. All of them have best several Nobel prizes. And this guy is the latest addition to this standard model. It was theoretically it was supposed to be there. People were looking. So all the experimentalists were on toes. They were on their toes to, to find out this guy. Because uh, people like me and my counterpart, they said, no, there has to be a Higgs. There has to be a Higgs. You have to find it. So uh, eventually this was discovered and a uh, couple of years ago the Nobel Prize has gone to this at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, CERN. So that completes the standard model picture. And now if you know these elementary particles, how do they talk to each other, what are the rules, they obey. So Mr. Feynman gives the rules, Feynman prescription, and these are called Feynman diagram. This is just a function of scattering. So electron, photon, it's going to electron, electron, photon. Okay, if you sort on this line to zero, then this would be a classical interaction, but this is a virtual particle and electron for, for some time, and this is quantum mechanical interaction. If an electron is going, another electron is going, they talk to each other via the exchange of a photon. One guy emits a photon, another guy absorbs that photon, and this is how they feel the presence of each other. So this is quantum mechanical interaction, this is called the Feynman diagram. These are actually the lowest order diagrams in field theory. And you can apply perturbation theory, you read it in quantum mechanics. So you start with your perturbation theory and you make the covariant version of the perturbation theory. Covariant perturbation theory you apply, from there you can find out the rules uh, which obey this. I teach the, these rules in my field theory 2 uh, paper on the special paper of quantum field theory 2. Now, uh, here I would like to point out this one particular point, that mass energy relation. If I increase the mass of a proton, uh, if I somehow accelerate it and I make it 10 to the power 18 times the rest mass, and if I make these two protons to collide, the two protons accelerate it to these high energies, and if I make them collide, then the gravitational force and electromagnetic force, they become identically equal to each other. And one cannot ignore gravity in the Conventional particle physics gravity has to be taken into account. So this is a thought experiment, but nevertheless, even though it cannot be, be realized today, but maybe sometime one can one can realize it in practice, uh, because it needs huge technological development. It's not just one go, and it's not the job of a theorist alone. You have to develop corresponding technology. You see, just read the history and the details of the CERN experiment in Geneva. How much they know? Twenty-seven miles. Uh, arc length and deep inside and maintaining at how many uh, temperatures, very, 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 very low temperatures, almost close to not really zero Kelvin, but very close, very low temperature, maintaining all these huge rings of these experiments. You need, you need collective efforts of experiments and theory, you see, to, 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 to develop, to advance. Uh, it's not just a, just not a theoretical idea and you say, okay, that's the job of a theorist. No. We collectively work and all these young people, they are needed to, to, to make the corresponding uh, advances in, in computers, in technology, in all these experiments. So it goes hand in hand, okay? And now here I would like to recap uh, a difference in the Newtonian gravity and Einstein gravity. Uh, and in particular for the younger students, supposing I have two, two objects, uh, one is having mass m1, one is having mass m2, and there is some distance r1 between them, you can immediately calculate the force of uh, gravity between them, m1, m2 by r square. Now I change this r1 to r2, then the force between them would change from f1 to f2. Alright? Now, according to Newtonian gravity, this F1 to F2 should change in no amount of time, in zero amount of time. 
It should just happen instantly. But Mr. Einstein says, no, that's incorrect. That's not the way. Nothing is supposed to travel faster than light, not even the gravitational field. So gravitational field propagates via the exchange of gravitons. They also travel with the velocity of light, with the speed of light. And so this force between them changes from F1 to F2 in a non-zero positive definite amount of time. Howsoever close to zero, but some positive uh, non-zero time. And that is so gravity is to be treated as a field theory of gravity. Okay, And the mediators are gravitons. So uh, we come back to this diagram and we say, okay, so this is electron-electron scattering via the exchange of a photon. If Mr. Einstein says, okay, let me just replace this photon by a graviton. But the life is not so easy as you plan it. There can be storms in the midnight at 4, 4 a.m. Then you have to clean up the tree. Sam would immediately agree with me. Uh, what was that? Uh, solutions? Which solutions were they? Up clean cleaning solutions. Oh. Uh, surface solutions. There was some company working in your university with landscape solutions. Landscape solutions. So you see, there are problems. Trees can fall and you have to clean it up. So it's not just a matter of replacing this photon by a graviton. But these vertices are zero dimensional vertices and this transition amplitude of this process, if you calculate it, it's not difficult to calculate. Uh, I can even, if somebody is interested, I can, I can show it uh, later on. But then this probability comes out to be infinite. And this infinite probability is not acceptable, it has to be finite, definite. So what do you do about it? That is the point. So somehow we have to worry about these zero dimensional vertices. Now these zero dimensional vertices, uh, we have this thing called as Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You read it in quantum mechanics, you also read it in modern physics everywhere. Uh, Mr. Heisenberg was the guy who got his Nobel Prize at the age of 26, 27. Okay. So you can you can achieve what you want. You only need to determine, and therefore I all the time invoke Mr. Buddha, my friend. So you need to need, need to concentrate and you can do anything that you like. God has given you infinite capabilities. Okay. So uh, now, for electromagnetic interactions, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle helps us because the electrostatic force between the two objects is Q1, Q2 by R square. Okay? So it will, the force will blow up at R equal to 0. It will give rise to a singularity at this point. However, uncertainty principle helps us to square out this singularity and you can, you can get away. That is, this process is called as renormalization theory in quantum field theory. You can renormalize re your theory, but for the gravity theory, if I replace it by graviton, graviton and then this point zero dimensional uh, vertices, then this will not work because I have no corresponding Heisenberg uncertainty principle at the scales of 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters, the Planckian scales, length scale. I have no such. You can write down, but it will have no meaning at the length of 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters. Okay. So, in, in, in normal field theory, you talk at the length of 10 to the power minus 8 centimeters, not 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters. Okay, so that is the point. So, uh, that, therefore, what we need to do that this conventional diagram with a zero dimensional vertex here has to be replaced by this finite dimensional vertex. So, here is a string, it goes like that, it's split into two, this could be a closed string, this could be an open string. But the idea is that this vertex in gravity theory has to be spread it in space time. It can't be in zero dimensional vertex. That is the point. And if you do that, then the theory becomes super renormalizable. No infinity is left whatsoever. And you can get wonderful uh, physical results. Okay? Because actually before this, I, I didn't go into details. I explained it in my earlier talk that, that uh, an electron, for example, consists has a bare mass and a physical mass. What you observe in the laboratory is the physical mass, and but it has some bare mass. Bare mass is actually infinite. And this happens because of the vacuum fluctuations, which are also infinite, but the two happen in the right way to cancel each other, and the physical charge is, uh, is finite, which you can measure in the lab, uh, and not the bare charge. So that is the renormalization theory. Now, in this case, you don't need it anymore because the, the vertex is spreading into space time. So that's wonderful. So we arrive at some idea, we think, okay, logically, 
this, this sounds great. So we replace the zero dimensional particles by one dimensional strings and this typical length of a string is 10 to the power minus 33. Today we cannot realize it because uh, our present day energies, technologies, they can measure it up to 10 to the power minus 18 centimeters. You have to go to 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters. It's much, much beyond. But, but one day our, our younger generations would realize this.